This is a photo of a premature baby shortly after birth. How does it make you feel? Nervous, perhaps? Anxious? Well, however you're feeling while looking at this photo right now, imagine how it must have felt for my parents over 17 years ago, knowing the very real possibility that their first child could have been permanently physically or mentally impaired. So why are you able to relate to that uncertainty? Why are you able to relate to the anxiety and nervousness when looking at this photo? And the answer is that we all know how uncertainty affects us. We've all been there. So this case is no different. The baby's fate is uncertain. As we look at the factors that might affect this baby's outcome, we realize that we don't really know anything about whoever it is. And so whether they come out fine or not is something that we would only know after seeing it and believing it. So it's not only here, though, that uncertainty causes us this anxiety. Can anyone from the audience right now give me an example of why they might be nervous about something? IB results. IB results. <laughs> All right, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty nervous about that too. So <laughs> let's say I were to look into your future and um, I would just be able to tell that you're going to fail your IB. You were just going to do abysmally, like every goal you had set out for yourself, you were just going to completely fall short. You wouldn't be nervous, per se, about your IB results anymore. Perhaps you'd be nervous about how that might affect other things, like how your parents and friends might look at you, or how universities might not accept you anymore. But that's not to do with the exams themselves. That's to do with their effects. So you see, because the uncertainty in the results of those exams are now gone, so is that anxiety. So we've evolved, really, to fear uncertainty. And perhaps this was necessary. So, you know, millions of years ago, if you saw a lion in the bushes, it would probably be smarter to turn around than to walk into the lion's mouth. But to this day, we still fear uncertainty in much the same way. So why is that? Well, today, I want to tell you from a different perspective why this uncertainty is not only inevitable, but fundamentally useful. I want to tell you about how uncertainty, which is simply just a lack of truth about the future, is actually useful and how humans have actually learned how to capitalize on it. And I want to tell you why our view of the world is fundamentally incompatible with reaching a fully justified truth. And to start addressing all these lofty concepts, I'm going to start with a very simple example of a coin flip. So when you flip a coin, there's about a 50% chance that you get a heads and a 50% chance that you get a tails, give or take. So let's say I flipped a coin, and as it was rotating in the air, one of you from the audience came up to me and asked, hey, Rohan, is the coin right now in a heads or a tails? So one way of answering that question could be for me to say, I don't know yet. I haven't been able to catch the coin in my hand yet, so I don't know what the outcome is going to be. Only once I catch the coin in my hand and I see what the result is, then I will know whether the coin is in a heads or a tails state. But another way of answering the exact same question is by saying, there's some probability that it'll be a heads, and there's some probability that it'll be a tails. Right now, they're about 50% each, and when I catch the coin in my hand, I will force one of those probabilities to be 100% and the other one to be 0%. So for example, if I catch the coin in my hand and I see that it's a tails, then I'm 100% sure that its state is a tails, and 0% sure that its state is a heads. So because its probability of being a heads or a tails is 50-50 while it's flipping in the air, I can say that the coin is in both a head state and a tail state at the same time. And the act of ascribing both of these states to the coin is called a superposition. So we say that the coin is in a superposition between a heads and a tails as it's flipping. So this example isn't actually a perfect example of a superposition because coin flips aren't exactly random. You see, if someone were to tell me the exact way in which I flipped the coin, from the force to which I applied, to the angle, to the air resistance in the room, there would probably be a way to calculate whether I'd get a heads or a tails. But there are other events in the universe that are really, truly random, that behave similarly to the coin flip that we see here. And to illustrate one of those, I'm going to use a very familiar concept, light waves. Now, light, as we might have heard before, travels as a wave. And so it oscillates back and forth. And that light can oscillate pretty much in any direction. The direction in which it oscillates is something we call a polarization. 
Now, this might sound really complicated, but I have three diagrams here to help me. So in the top left-hand corner, we see the light that's notated as red oscillating completely up and down. There's no side-to-side -side motion whatsoever. So we call that light vertically polarized. On the top right-hand corner, we have the complete opposite of that. The light is moving completely from side to side with no up and down motion at all. So we call it horizontally polarized. Now, the bottom diagram shows an interesting case. The light blue light that you see, which is stacked on top of the vertically polarized light and the horizontally polarized light, is actually in a mix between the two. You see, it's at an angle between purely vertical and purely horizontal. So there are some aspects of it which are moving up and down, and there are some aspects of it which are moving from side to side. So we can actually think of that light blue light as being somewhere in between, or a mix of the vertically polarized light and the horizontally polarized light. Now this might seem familiar. You see, it's exactly the same as the coin flip from before. The coin flip, when we caught it, was either a heads or a tails. But while it was in the air, it was both a heads and a tails, much in the same way that this light blue light is both vertically polarized and horizontally polarized to some extent. So let's complete this analogy. Let's say that the vertically polarized light is like getting a heads, and the horizontally polarized light is like getting a tails. So as we just said, the light blue light, which is somewhere in the mix between the two, is both heads and tails at the same time, so while the coin is flipping. Now, the only thing missing from this analogy is what it actually means to catch the coin. Recall that when we were flipping the coin, what it meant to actually catch it was to get rid of the superposition in the coin. It was to force one of the probabilities to be 100% and force the other probability to be 0%, which would mean that the light blue light would have to be either forced into being vertically polarized or forced into being horizontally polarized. So, what could possibly do this? Well, for the sake of simplicity, let's say that the thing that catches the light is a pair of polarizing sunglasses. Now, you might be familiar with the concept of polarizing sunglasses. Essentially, what they do is ensure that all of the light coming in one end through the other is of one polarization, meaning that if I were to wear a pair of polarizing sunglasses, the light that would be hitting my eyes would only be oscillating in one plane. So if I had a vertically uh, polarized pair of sunglasses, then the light that would be hitting my eye would be exactly like the red light, and only that vertically polarized. So what the sunglasses are actually asking, if you think about it, is, is the light that's coming through vertically polarized or horizontally polarized? If it is vertically polarized, it'll go through the sunglasses. And if it's not vertically polarized, that is to say horizontally polarized, then it will stop right there. Now, the interesting thing is that if we think about what happens when the light blue light actually interacts with the polarizing sunglasses, it's very similar to the coin flip example. Because the light blue light is in a superposition between the vertically polarized light and the horizontally polarized light, there is some probability when it interacts with the polarizing sunglasses that it comes through and becomes vertically polarized, and there's some probability that it gets blocked, which means that it's horizontally polarized. You see, when we caught the coin in our hand, there was some probability that it would be a heads and some probability that it would be a tails. And when we caught it, the actual result of that was revealed to us in the same way that when the light interacts with the polarizing sunglasses, the state of that light is revealed to us, either vertical or horizontal. Now, the interesting thing about this example is that the light blue light isn't vertically polarized or horizontally polarized to begin with, but it's forced into one of those two when interacting with the polarizing sunglasses. And the second interesting thing is that in interacting with the polarizing sunglasses, the probability to, with which the light blue light actually goes through or not is just that, a probability. It's not the same as the coin flip example because it's impossible to predict what will actually happen. In, in other words, the light blue light interacting with the polarizing sunglasses is an example of a truly random event. Whether it goes through or not is completely unpredictable. So, Already, we've seen that there are some things in the universe that are truly random and truly unpredictable. I mean, there are other examples, too. You, you know, there are lots of quantum mechanical phenomena that operate on pure randomness. This is just one of them. So already, we see that uncertainty in our universe is inevitable. But how does that make it useful? Well, now, let me draw an analogy between light and the ways that computers operate to demonstrate why this inherent uncertainty 
is actually useful. So every single computer that you own, from the ones that are maybe in your bags right now to the ones you might own at home, to the huge supercomputers in Google's and Facebook's data centers, all of them can be classified under the broad term of a classical computer. And what defines a classical computer is that they operate purely on types of information called bits. Bits stand for binary digits. So from the name, you could probably guess that they only have two possible states, a one and a zero. Now, in the case of this light, you could think about it as being that classical computers can only operate with modes of information such as the vertically polarized light and the horizontally polarized light. Nothing else. So what's interesting is that quantum computers operate on a completely different kind of information scheme. They operate on qubits, or quantum bits. Now, the special thing about quantum bits is that they can hold information about things that are between a zero and a one. So what that would mean is that quantum computers could use the light blue light in their calculations because it's between a heads and a tails, or a one and a zero. And if you think about it, there are actually an infinite number of ways that the light blue light could be in between a vertical state and a horizontal state, because any angle would really work. And so because of this, quantum computers are actually extremely efficient when it comes to solving certain problems. The very way in which they deal with information creates that efficiency. But instead of talking to you about how exactly that efficiency emerges, I want to talk to you instead about what quantum computers could ac actually accomplish, starting with how they would affect the realm of encryption. Now, encryption sounds like a very fancy term, but what it actually is, is just simply locking away information and then unlocking it uh, later on. So let's say I wanted to send in, uh, a piece of information to somebody in the crowd. Let's, let's call you person A, whoever you are. And I basically wanted to tell you a massive secret, but I didn't want anybody else in the crowd to hear, hear me and understand it. So what I'll say is I'll tell person A beforehand that my message is going to go to you in English, except that every single letter in the English alphabet is going to be shifted down by three places. So when somebody else overhears me shouting this message to you across the stage, they're just going to hear a garbled mess. They're not going to understand what's going on. But you, in your head, have the key. You know that you can shift all of the letters back three places in order to get the actual English language that the information was meant to be written in. So today, I want to talk to you about a specific kind of encryption that's widely used in the internet. It's called RSA encryption. And the idea of RSA encryption is that its lock and key system is based solely on prime numbers. Now, let's say A and B are two prime numbers. Okay? That would mean, under RSA, that the lock would be A multiplied by B. And the key would be A and B separately. Now, the special thing about RSA encryption is that A times B, which is the lock, is publicly known. For example, if I wanted to tell person A my code, my, my information in RSA code, the, all of you in the audience would know what my lock is. So you might be wondering why you can't just figure out the key from the lock by just using some sort of mathematical formula. Well, to demonstrate that, I'm going to make all of you the hackers. I'm going to tell you that my lock is the number 7081. Can any of you tell me what the two prime numbers are that multiply to 7,081? <laughs> you see, it's extremely difficult. Even if you were to use a calculator, it would be extremely difficult. I'm not talking about the GDCs that you know, have these very fancy computing powers. I'm talking about a basic calculator. It would be very difficult for you to deduce what the two prime numbers are that multiply to 7,081. But instead, if I told you to just simply do 97 times 73 in your calculator, you'd probably be able to get it a lot faster. Classical computers face the same issues as I've just shown here. Classical computers can easily multiply any two numbers, including these prime numbers. But it's much more difficult for them to take a big product of prime numbers and split them into the pr two prime numbers that multiply to get it. This, coupled with the fact that RSA encryption uses prime numbers that are hundreds of digits long, mean that classical computers would take thousands of years in order to decrypt a basic piece of RSA encrypted information. Far, far longer than that, that information would actually be valuable in the day that they were encrypted. So what's interesting about all of this is that quantum computers change everything. Quantum computers and operating on qubits, have actually been theoretically been shown to use an algorithm called Shor's algorithm, 
What's special about Shor's algorithm is that the efficiency of factorizing out numbers like a times b increases massively. So what used to take classical computers thousands of years can now be done by quantum computers in two minutes. So if you think about that, if I was talking to person A in RSA code, one of you in the audience, knowing my public key, sorry, my public lock, could easily, with a two-minute delay, listen in on our conversation. Now, luckily, quantum computers are still at least 50 years away, so all of that's not going to happen anytime soon. And even if quantum computers were developed, it would give rise to a type of cryptography called quantum encryption, and that's completely immune to the effects that I'm describing here. So I want to move on. Let's instead talk about an application of quantum computing, molecular simulation. So it just so happens that the interaction between qubits lend themselves very nicely to fields of mathematics such as combinatorics, which allow molecular simulation to be done on a much more efficient scale. And this is really important because chemical engineers, for example, could vastly increase the time by which they develop new materials. They could test their chemicals with other different molecules at a much quicker rate, allowing them to quickly start out which chemicals will uh, carry out their intended processes. Another thing that quantum computers could help with in this realm is modeling extremely rare and difficult to treat diseases, such as cancer and AIDS. Because these diseases involve many complicated systems throughout the body. Uh, throughout the body. And the way in which combinatorics works allows us to model it much more effectively. So what would end up happening is that quantum computers would, would uh, allow us to solve these kind of diseases at a much quicker rate, perhaps even finding a cure for them. Finally, I want to talk to you about how quantum computers can search through lists at a much, much faster rate than classical computers. Now, this is by far the most boring application of, uh, of quantum computers, so I've got a nice picture of a data center to keep you entertained while I talk about this. Um, so it just so happens that quantum computers can search through lists much, much faster than classical computers using an algorithm called Grover's algorithm. Now, the reason why this is so interesting is because massive tech companies today, such as Google, Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, Netflix, and so on, keep tabs on their customers. Multiple, multiple fields of information about every single one of their millions of customers are stored in their massive databases. And so when a customer makes an inquiry, maybe searches up a movie, all of these pieces of information have to be stitched up together by these companies. And what, what's interesting is that quantum computers would be able to do this much faster because they're able to sort through the massive lists of information at a much quicker rate, which is why so many companies these days are investing so much money into quantum computers. To give you an example of that, here's a picture of the core of one of IBM's quantum computers that they're developing right now. Now, this might look small to you until you see the actual encasing that goes around that. This entire room is for one quantum computer that has a hundred thousandth of the power that we would actually need to display any of the effects that I've been talking about today. So we're still a very, very long way away from reaching quantum computers at mass market or even to the scale where big tech companies could capitalize on them. But until then, there's still some takeaways that we can, t that we can get from the advent of quantum technologies. The first is, that we should never be too obsessed with reaching some sort of ultimate truth or eradicating all of the uncertainty in our lives. Because after all, on a very philosophical level, the fundamental way in which the universe is built prohibits complete certainty. As we saw with the light example, it's impossible to predict every single event in the universe. The second thing I want to talk about is that our intuition about basic concepts are often wrong. Uncertainty is something that we see as an, an, an inherently negative effect, but when applied to a different field such as physics, it can be extremely useful in breaking previous lids on technologies. The last thing I want to leave you with is a quote by Niels Bohr, one of the fathers of quantum physics. And I think his quote really sums up what my talk has been about today, but also about the absurdity of quantum physics and other fields of knowledge. The opposite of a true statement is a false statement, but the opposite of a profound truth may well be another profound truth. Thank you.